ultimately, it's happening way faster than anyone else can make it happen. There's That's no exactly one it. else who is even remotely close to being able to offer this service at high levels of scale before Tesla will reach that scale. So the intuition that we had early on was that this is going to be, the, the improvement is not going to be linear, it's going to be exponential. Because that's what these neural nets are for the system to do. So you know, we've used the, the AlphaGo example in the past, right? We've used all these different systems that use neural nets where they go from uh, terrible to okay to better than a human to godlike. Like it appears like it kind of happens overnight. So nothing kind of happens. And then all of a sudden it's like gone. It's like completely beyond, right? These chess engines, the same thing, Stockfish, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the, all the other systems playing uh, AlphaGo and, and, or yeah, we already mentioned that one. So it's like, it's another one of those lessons that says um, it's appropriate to use learnings from a adjacent field using the same fundamental structure, the same fundamental approach to try to predict if this system will work or not, right? And now we have, you know, again, Granted that the testing will go well. Granted that, you know, we make it out alive on Sunday and whenever, when, you know, however often you write this, et cetera, et cetera. But I just, I think we're at the point now where knowing, knowing how much hate Tesla gets in public, knowing how much hate Elon gets, knowing how much scrutiny Elon gets, knowing how many enemies he's made in politics to launch this, right? To launch this and actually have it go live. It's, you know, it's either an exercise of one last day one last ditch effort, like tr magically make the brand relevant again, or it's a culmination of the data points and the real world experiences we've been monitoring for years actually bearing fruit. And it's actually bearing fruit. I 100% agree that it is actually bearing fruit. And I do agree that, you know, these on a relative basis, these things go from being worse than a human by far and all the skepticism to then being dramatically better than a human in relatively short order. But I think we do need to um, contextualize what it is that Tesla's doing here that all of the all of the AI systems that have been built up to now that have reached that superhuman level have been within a context of basically text data, right? That you know you can process whether it's a chess engine or ChatGPT or any of these things that these AI systems are really good at. They're operating in the realm of things that can be described by text, and that this, in so many ways, is similar to you know the 1990s era of the internet or the pre windows 95 era of personal computers where you've got some stupid command line interface and you have to learn how to use ms dos in order to do anything on your computer and it's just incredible that tesla has achieved the level of safety performance with this neural net technology in an environment where it has to operate purely on video inputs and so they are really pushing the bleeding edge of what is possible with neural nets in the context of, you know, like the information density of text is going to be a lot higher than, well, it's hard to explain this, I guess, but just think about text versus audio versus video and the process that we had to go through in the internet to have enough bandwidth in order to be able to download a song. You know, it used to be from when you're on Kazaa or uh, Napster, Napster or whatever. <laughs> it would take you like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour to download yeah. a couple of minutes worth of music. And then how the heck, if, you, if it takes that long just to download music that's not that data intense, man, video is like never going to happen. Right. Except that it absolutely is going to happen because Moore's law is driving the, you know, the fundamental improvements of all of these systems and everything had to get better. You know, the modem in your computer had to get better. The network switches had to get better. The ability to transport information, long distances, 
through cable and then fiber optic and all that stuff, all that stuff had to get better. And every single one of those problems had to be solved in order for YouTube to be possible. Um, you know, I think right now with neural net based stuff that this is like the very early signs of what's going to be possible with things that operate in the video context. And, and because Elon and Tesla are so far at the forefront of developing that type of a system at scale, I think that it might take us longer than we are hoping for in order for, you know, Tesla to be able to roll out robo taxi network at the scale of hundreds of thousands or millions of vehicles at those superhuman safety levels, because there's a lot of infrastructure to build up around, you know, making all of that stuff work that well at the latencies that are required. And so I think we're, we're there in terms of ready to start this process. We're there in terms of this technology absolutely will solve this problem. Um, and it could also be, you know, 18 months at least before the network is able to reach the type of scale that a lot of us are assuming is going to happen by the end of the year. Okay. But are people assuming that the, by the end of the year, I mean, so, so, okay. So, so let's, it's still just a year and a half away. Yeah. Or, that, you know, <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. It's still going to happen. It That's might just happen nothing. a little bit slower. And and yeah, 18 months compared to the last eight years that we've been doing instead of six months. Like, let me rephrase it. So it's obvious it's going to happen within an, a year and a half. Whereas before, like, you know, like the, the struggle with this whole thing has been like, when, like, when, when the, the thing has always been like two weeks, six months, definitely within a month. And then it just has been pushed out and pushed out and pushed out and pushed out. But now with this launch in Austin now and knowing what we know about the rate of progress and the compute ramp, et cetera, et cetera. Now we have points on the dot that we can actually like start to plot out. And so now th there is a lot of confidence around that statement of like worst case, 24 months, literal worst case, 24 months. Yeah, that's, I would say my, the way that I feel like handicapping it just from my gut feel and I've, I yeah. tend to be on the conservative side, side on this thing is that we should really be able to have no safety drivers in the car, um, relatively minimal remote supervision to where we can be reaching tens of thousands of vehicles worth of scale in 18 months. I think that's like 80% likely. And then 20% that maybe it gets pushed out farther than that 18 months. Um, there is also on the flip side, there's a 20% chance that man, like, we just have to do some validation here for a little while to that like the next version 14 level that they have installed on these robo taxis is just insanely good and yeah. the safety level is off the charts and that we just have to be cautious so that we can validate it and then you know a month from now we can do a 10 X of our 10 cars. And then a month after that, it's another 10 X. And then a month after that, it's another 10 X. And then you're, you know, in the thousands of cars by the end of the year type of scenario. Like that's definitely possible. I would say that's a lower probability than it taking longer than that. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's happening and it's happening definitely ultimately it's happening way faster than anyone else can make it happen. There's That's no exactly one it. else who is even remotely close to being able to offer this service at high levels of scale before Tesla will reach that scale. And it's going to be a network effect business where the first person to establish the most network effects is going to have a massive advantage in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah, exactly it. And that, so like, like to put it in perspective for the next 12 to 18 months that Tesla is going to be scaling the, the network to where it's most everywhere to most people, right? Waymo is going to add 3000 cars to its network. That's literally exactly what's going to happen, you know? So Waymo will add 3000 cars and Tesla will be everywhere. And it will. And, and so the, the, uh, by that logic, we, we will know if that's becoming true if by sometime 
by the and end Uber of will next... add a fraction of that three thousand cars. And exactly, and Uber will add a fraction of those three thousand cars. Exactly. So we'll know if we're, if we're on the pathway of that. If if uh, within the next twelve months or so, Tesla has overtaken Waymo's rides per week, right? And then in the markets where it's available, like Austin, LA, yeah. SF, wherever, New York, Orlando, wherever they go live, the, they start seriously eating into the market share of ride share period. But just like how Waymo has eaten into market share of ride share in SF and, and now has more rides than Lyft, which is an unbelievably awesome achievement by that company. I mean, like truly unbelievable, like truly, truly unbelievable. But it, it is the example of why this use case is so disruptive is that even a, like a, I'm going to call, can I call Waymo a legacy self-driving company? Can I do sure. it? Yeah. Okay. It. In, in the way that legacy self-driving companies, even with their complexities and their cost structure and their approach with the technology, which is sort of like uh, hodgepodge, let's brute force it, or works. Let's make be clear, it works and they were first to market and they should have every prop imaginable for that achievement, but they're in a box. They are in a box and they're still beating one of the two rideshare companies in the markets that they're offering. Yeah, I mean, the way that I look at Waymo is that it is still a prototype company and a prototype service. And obviously yeah. Tesla is also still in the prototype service when it comes to robotaxis specifically. But the the challenge, just like Elon always says, is you know prototypes are easy, production is hard. Elon has obviously been thinking about the production is hard, like how do we make the production is hard phase of offering millions of miles of autonomous ride hail service per day as easy as humanly possible. Yeah, he's been thinking about what is the ultimate end state of a successful ride hail company for probably a decade or more. Yeah. And they have proactively taken the routes that they think make that reality a reality, you know, that um that hypothetical service a reality as quickly as humanly possible. Yeah. And you know, offering the prototype service the first is not a guarantee that the prototype that you built is a prototype that can scale. And that's, you know, all of us who've been following this for so long and think about the way that Waymo is approaching this versus the way that Tesla is approaching it, realize that if, and it is it is still somewhat of an if because we haven't seen it, but if Tesla can offer the same quality of ride hail service that Waymo can offer, but they can do it the way that they're approaching the problem, like you've said many times, with a computer that's way cheaper, with sensors that are way cheaper, and with a car that literally comes off the end of the manufacturing line ready to go, instead of has to be built by some other company somewhere else that sucks at a lot of different things that you don't get to control. And then you take that and you send it to another factory and then you build a whole bunch of stuff on it. For, from a sensor standpoint, and then you wire it up for your computer and you got to use a way bigger computer and, 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 well, then obviously, if the Tesla comes off the end of the line ready to be a self-driving car and the Waymo doesn't, then the Tesla is going to be able to operate much more cheaply than the Waymo. Yeah. And, and, you know, last time I checked, Uber and Lyft was all about, like, no one cares if they're riding a Lyft versus an Uber. All they care about is how long did it take to pick me up? How long did it take to get there? What did it cost? And how bad was the experience of interfacing with this driver? Yeah. You know, did they drive like a maniac? Did they stink to high heaven? Were they rude to me? Were, you know, was I was just trying car disgusting. to- disgusting? Yeah, yeah, was the car disgusting? Was I just trying to concentrate on doing some work and they wouldn't shut up? Yeah, yeah. That's like, it. what- Jeff Bezos is awesome when he talks about what are the things that are never going to change? Like, are customers ever going to want slower deliveries? Are they ever going to want to pay more in shipping? Like, no, obviously I'm not. <laughs> so, so the same will be true for ride hailing. Is, is a customer ever going to want a car with a smellier human 
who's <laughs> ruder, who gets in their face, a service that takes longer to pick them up and yeah. cost them more. No, it's it's pretty obvious that the service that. OK, so so let's let's make a statement. The variables that will ensure a ride hailing company will be the winner is the one that can offer the lowest wait times and the lowest costs and the best in car ex experience. Is that a fair statement? A hundred percent. And it's going to okay. be, you know, some complex combination of those three factors. Yeah. 